with focused attention, you enter the astral dimension. Portals are present beyond average perception. Pulling and pulsing, magnetic suspension, floating and forming, far presence, ascension. Through artistic vision and crystal kaleidoscopic division, all within seconds, time releases its perceptual revision. Saturnian prism smashed by the fission, two luminary bodies of light, a tremendous collision. Procession, precision, the celestial Jupiterian embodied as the Sagittarian. A truth of this variant can increase your awareness at a distance. You'll find a stairway, follow it, and dream the path of least resistance. I'm Mystic Mark. Thank you for joining me here on today's episode of the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. Today's guest is artist and Reiki energy worker, Laura Milo Manning. And it starts right now. create that momentum to push through the that conflict like that dualistic conflict like we're in harmony through conflicts that's the energy of earth so if you work and it's it serves that way because the tension creates the momentum to move forward and so i just think of it as this tension from two sides and i choose a, a shape or a word to keep repeating my energy on and it will break through that contrast to the next level that's how i work I, it's very visual the whole structure of old eras is built on mm. and we just had this constellation happen it's like last christmas where saturn and jupiter made this v in the sky and then started to go the other way so, so Jupiter overtook Saturn now, and my stargates are linked to Jupiter through the sun. Like, they're actual portals. I saw into the deep depths of the universe the first time, like, an actual portal came out, and then it integrates the energy. So, anyway, that was cool. Jupiter overtook Saturn. a little bit more first i just wasn't sure if we we were already rolling or not yeah um, we could so zoom doesn't really uh i don't really use zoom to record i have my mixer and i have obs over here recording okay. so yeah we're recording now and if anything uh doesn't make the cut we'll cut it out but welcome to the my family think some crazy podcast we could just hey. <laughs> keep chatting and and roll right into it but okay. uh but okay. yeah I, I think there's an energy in new haven that is very centered around education, religion, society, and there's this sort of undercurrent that Geronimo, Skull and Bones, and some other aspects of New Haven's culture, they sort of, they're like inverted aspects of the very prominent, like, outward facing, oh yeah, we're so good, look at our science building, look at our religious building, we're so smart, the brightest kids, you know, and there has to be an equal and opposite force to that, right? And for the longest time, I thought, well, there's the sort of dilapidated parts of New Haven. There's the lesser fortunate parts of New Haven. Those are sort of like reflecting the the high energy. But, you know, when you think of how many souls are literally buried underneath the, the green in New Haven... It just makes you think, like, what is going on there? You know, I've had a many different experiences in New Haven that were strange. I know f people who have had strange experiences. So I guess my question to start with you is, when did you start picking up on New Haven's weird energy? 
Uh, well, so I was I was born at Yale New Haven Hospital, and I grew up in the Westville section of New Haven, and I loved it. I, we had this cute little white house, and I, I just really loved the 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 blocks that we had. I had a best friend on the street. Um, I went to an alternative education program. It was part of the public schools at that time, uh, Bank Street style education in the West Hills. So I have this like alternative uh, learning style that really helped me have this unique foundation on top of being from New Haven because we had moved to a, a suburb nearby um, by the time I was in fourth grade. So to me, I've always like thought it was really unique that I had this New Haven foundation. It was different than the other kids that I met uh, throughout life, um, my other friends. Um, so I've always wondered like, why, you know, why was I uh, born and raised there? And the name New Haven is, Haven is supposed to be uh, like a, a, um, a safe place. And the city is kind of uh, contradicts that in a lot of ways, because there's actually, it's not like the safest city. Uh, it's kind of ironic with Connecticut. They have very high crime rates in the cities, but the suburbs are more affluent. Um, so when I started to go through my spiritual awakening process, I started to analyze more about um, like where I'm from, what time I was born, uh, all of this. Uh, Cause it all like plays into who you are as an individual, uh, your natal chart really guides your life path. So I, I started to look at New Haven more, um, New Haven, New Heaven, New Earth. Uh, but it's, I, I always feel, I always thought that it has so much potential that just kind of, it doesn't ever really get there. So I've been really curious about why and that's why when I came across your work I was just floored because I'm like wow this is cool like somebody's like investigating the deeper underpinnings the energetic tones of the city uh and so why isn't there more uh progress there as far as it uh being more livable and uh less crime um even though it has a lot of really great aspects to it uh so I suppose like the spiritual awakening part was when I got really more interested in, in New Haven, but it's always kind of been there in the mm. back of my head. Like why, why was I born and raised there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, you know, I was born and raised a few towns over. And when I finally made my way to New Haven around 17, 18, I was just, amazed at everything that was there to be seen you know was bustling city only a few you know minutes from where I grew up and for mm -hmm. the most part outside of going to the Coliseum to see the circus I had never even really spent any time in New Haven and you'd think that <laughs> you know with all of these things going on there it'd be a place where families would go and it really isn't because of that cr crime yeah. you know like as a kid I yeah. was insulated from New Haven so yeah. when I when I got old enough to go there on my own, I was fascinated. I was like, whoa, what is this place? It's like right next to me. It's been here my whole life. I've never experienced. And uh, it doesn't have an outwardly spiritual expression, I would say, but there is something uniquely spiritual about New Haven. Like it, mm -hmm. it seems to be a facilitator for all an awakening in, in not just myself, not just you, but other people I've met as well. Wow. Yeah. I was fascinated by uh, some of those uh, old illustrations, like the original maps um, mm. of the New Haven green that you've shown on other podcasts. Uh, I was really just fascinated by those designs um, and it being on a ley line uh, through to all the way down to Mexico, um, which I've learned from your, your podcasts. Uh, so it's, a, yeah, it's a unique place. I mean, Yale is so prominent there. Mm. Um, that's what people think of. And, uh, I, I mean, I've been on the Yale tour and I've been in the city. I've been around it. Uh, I've, I've driven by Skull and Bones. Um, 
And it's it's a curious place. Because it has this rep- reputation and a lot of attention. Uh, so I could see how that would resonate out into the, the city itself, like as an energy. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's rewind a little bit. So you, you said you grew up in New Haven and then you moved out when you're around, what, middle school, high school age? You, you went to a different town. What, what made you come back? You don't, do you live there now? Or are you, were you gravitated towards New Haven in your, you know, as you got older? Um, I, I'm New York, Connecticut now, but I don't, uh, for a while I was going back to the Westville section of it. Um, because I still had family living there and it's just always, it's always been in the back of my mind. Like why New Haven? Just if, I mean, it really started to click when I started to go through my spiritual awakening in 2015. Cause that's when I was analyzing my natal chart and where I was born. And, uh, this, the name of it being New Haven, the new heaven. And because I've already gone through, I've achieved the ascension process already over the past uh, well, I, I'd say the, the first like initiation was 2012, um, but it's been pretty full on the awakening process since 2015. And that ties into my Stargate artworks because these artworks ground the energy. Um, you can see them behind me. They started off as uh, you can see the yellow one is how the, they're, they were in the early stages is fabric and paint. And then they've developed over the past uh, eight years into a more circular form. Um, it was the way spirit like trained me and could test me to see if I'm trustworthy enough to study the mysteries and help transmute all these energies that we're going through as we shift into the new era, the new heaven, the new haven. So that's when I really started to get more interested in the city again and, um, just hearing about the different, um, the, the people that pass through there and then how they go out into the world and um, are in such prominent positions and they have a lot of power. And all that means a lot to me because energy fields, like a, your auric field will transmute energy. Like you can cleanse or purify a space that you're in if you have a certain vibration, like the higher your vibration, um, you clear it out. So I started to wonder about New Haven and all these people that were going through the system there, the, the Yale and um, the different clubs and uh, how that affected the city, how that affects the world. What are their energy fields like? Like, what are their intentions? Um, why was I born there? Because now I'm uh, gone through the ascension. So I'm purifying spaces with my energy field where I go. And it's like kind of this give and, give and take. Um, and then I came across your work and learned more about how the city is designed and the Geronimo thing I did not know about. Uh, that wasn't on my radar. And so I, I thought I'd do some distance Reiki on the city and on the campus, Yale campus, to try to clear the energy. And uh, yeah, it was a long time coming. It's a lot there. <laughs> yeah, I do want to talk about that. I don't want to rush right into it, but okay. when we when we talk about ascension and this experience that occurred in 2012, can we go back and and open up that saga, get started like how what yeah. do people need to know cuz that sounds very amazing. But I feel like I feel like there's a much more grounded, down to earth explanation for what you said, right? You weren't on some holy mountain with big spirits following you around, or maybe you were, but who knows? I want to know <laughs> what this ascension process was like. I don't, okay. I yeah, don't think we've had I, anyone on the show yet that that's ascended, so this is a privilege. It's, it's very uncommon, and I know, I mean, this is my everyday, but I know that a lot of people are not used to this kind of dialogue. Uh, I, I'm excited now because Spirit has guided me to speak 
publicly about it, whereas in previous ages, you just kept it close. You, you weren't meant to speak publicly because it's just, it was, it's just too strange for people to accept. But now we're in this new era. Some people call it age of Aquarius that we're shifting into. Um, I always try to stay flexible with labels, uh, but we're definitely shifting into a new era. And uh, it's humanity is graduating from being ruled by the emotional body. Cause there's, there's the plane of mind, there's the emotional body, there's the physical body. And the previous era, Age of Pisces, um, very cult-based. The Age of Pisces is uh, all about cults and following the leader, having like a school of fish. Um, old era, very competitive, uh, who can win. New era is all about uh, co-creation and lifting each other up. And uh, this new era is humanity is graduating to the plane of mind and we can talk about spiritual stuff now like because we did it we graduated we're at the plane of mind it's quantum we're in a quantum existence so uh, it's really cool and more and more people are going to be going through this spiritual awakening process so there's people like me that were like the forerunners that did this this uh po- process first in order to help pave the way for others like the first like it's the hardest to go through it the first or not. I, I mean, I'm not the first person ever in the history of the world to do this. Absolutely not. Thank God. Um, but the more people that go through it, the the path is like easier to navigate and it, right. it flows more, more quicker because we're in a, a system of most resistance mm-hmm. on earth. It's a duality. And well, it's so, like a path through the forest, you know, if, if nobody travels <laughs> through that for a while, the brush and the yes. vines are going to come and they're going to take the trail over. It takes a person to go through there first and knock it all out of the way. And pretty soon, you know, 30, 40, 50 people have walked that trail and it's a, right. a wide open path. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. That, that's totally, yeah, it's a great metaphor. Uh so the energies that are coming into our, we have one closed system. It brings more light into the system and everybody's energy bodies are connected. So as one person raises their vibration, it has more light in their energy field. It spreads to other people um, in a good way. <laughs> and this is the same with the, if it's like a negative energy, um, it, that's the same way. It will consume the, the collective as well. So Currently, we're bringing more light in, and it's this has been like a long time coming because uh, we've been in a, a, a dark system. I sometimes say darker light or good or bad, but it's really, I mean, that's just duality. We're all one. We're here to, to uplift the duality, to balance it. Uh, but as more light comes in, more people will spiritually awaken. And this new era we're shifting into allows for that expression, and it's gorgeous. And I started going through the ascension process in this lifetime because I've done it in previous lives. It's in my DNA. There's no way I could have gone through it this quickly uh, if I hadn't done it before. It's like a muscle memory type of of thing. Um, And there's like different benchmarks that you go through. Uh, In this realm, the realm of earth, there's nine major benchmarks or initiations. And the first two, you don't really realize that you go through. And that's like the goal spiritual workers have for the most, like the general, in general, people to get to the first or second benchmark. Like not everyone has to go through the full seven uh, or eight or even nine um, initiations. So the first one, the first and second, you realize once it's in hindsight and I was actually at this incredible artist residency in Banff, Canada, which is in the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> it's known as Switzerland of Canada. So it is incredible. And I'm a total mountain person. Um, this residency was life-changing. And uh, I just got to, to do a lot of hiking and be in the mountains and being that in that spirituality of the Rocky Mountains. Uh and I knew there was a shift when I was there, but I had did not have the language to describe it or the awareness yet of, of what that was. 
um, I just knew there was a, there was some sort of I I could tell there was some sort of like welcoming into something new, but I didn't know it would it was the first initiation and it was 2012, and uh, and then the second one uh, it occurred along the way. It wasn't as like amazing as the BAMP experience. <laughs> Um, and then the the third benchmark is when you start to be consciously aware of what's happening. It's an ascension is energy upgrades from within. Like I mentioned the old era is about cults. This era, like don't go join a club or a cult or anything like that. Cause it's all about the relationship between you and spirit from within. Like you don't need a third party involved in. Well, and that's why I think these podcasts have been so popular because it's like, you know, I'm I'm a non-invasive person in someone's life, right? When I listen to a podcast, I could hit pause and never listen to that again, right? If I if if it doesn't gel with me, I could hit pause. I'm out of here. If you join a cult and you want to hit pause, they're gonna they're gonna hypnotize you and convince you that you shouldn't leave, right? Whereas podcasting is like this, you know, open sport open source way towards spirituality that's what i found because there's no yeah. strings attached you know you can learn from me you can learn from old russell brand you can learn from you know uh eckhart tolle if he has a podcast yet whoever's out there you can listen yeah. and learn from them you can learn from laura manning right here right now uh yeah. laura well, mylot manning <laughs> <laughs> laura mylot manning sorry um <laughs> when you're in banff you, mm. you seem very uh thrilled about that experience can you yeah. tell us a little bit about it or would you uh, how much of this can you divulge I don't want to ask you to to give away any secrets oh no I mean uh <laughs> like I said I wasn't consciously aware of of even that there was an upgrade taking place I just I love the the environment so much like mm. you know, I'm on the east coast but I love the west coast uh, nature so it's I have this like you know paradox happening uh, so I was just thrilled to be out in the Rocky Mountains and with all these artists and it's a very spiritual place uh, it's it will call you there if you're meant to go and the First Nation people there they have you know a lot of respect for the area and it's just kind of this stream synchronicities all the time your dreams are like surreal like super realistic uh just like you're watching a movie uh it's it's probably one of the chakras of the earth i know like there's everyone has different chakras they claim or like mount shasta is people say it's the root or the the crown you know what i mean i'm guarantee there's a huge energy portal there in Banff. <laughs> oh totally so it's the first time i ever experienced anything like that and i really loved it yeah, thank you for elaborating there. I wasn't sure yeah. if you were talking about one singular experience, but it seems like the whole time there was yeah. uh, life changing. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I uh, yeah, I, I I've never been to Canada. I have roots in Canada. My grandparents are from New Brunswick, Canada, so there's part of Canada that's calling me. I don't know if it's Banff, but we'll see. Maybe that'll maybe that'll change. I think Peter Shampoo talks about Banff in his book Gaia Matrix, but uh but, Well, Who's I met I mentioned him in our messages. I know you're you're not familiar oh, with right. him. That's right, yeah, that's right, yeah. But uh Peter Shampoo, he's been on this show before and, and he has his uh chakra ley line, he calls it, and it goes through New England. Uh it's 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 not like a global chakra system the same way okay. people say like, you know, exactly as you described Mount Shasta, I think Kilimanjaro, uh, the yeah. Himalayas, they're all, all the sacred world mountains are, you know, chakra energies. Now is Banff on a, um, large mountain, like a, a global mountain or is, is it? Well, the, the Rocky mountains, but is there like one prominent, like, sort of pilgrimage mountain that people go to there like one that stands as like the grandfather mountain or grandmother mountain there's a few peaks that people visit and it's a national park as well right um but off the top of my head i can't remember okay. names so yeah. it's it must be you know 
all these local type of ley lines and then also part of like a world system. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's so complicated. I mean, I don't think we could figure it all out just in a conversation here, but it's, it's interesting to think about how all these energies flow around the world and certain points seem to be uh, aggregators of certain energy, spiritual energy here. Um, I guess why I ask about the like pilgrimage mountain is, you know, were there any particular um, places that stood out or is it the whole area itself? Like has any part in particular become like a place where people do ceremony or like a place where you go to be alone? Like any interesting anecdotes from Banff? I was mostly in the residency center, mm. which is, in a national park, I'd say the whole area is really sacred. Mm. And I participated in the residency. So I was, I had my studio and I was making paintings and um, doing stuff with the artists there. Wonderful. So yeah. you mentioned before that the, the stargates behind you mm -hmm. were part of this process. Did this occur to you when you were in Banff or was this sometime later on that, that you started doing this stargate art? These, those Stargates branched off from a different uh, Works on Canvas series that I was calling Super String, because I've always been really interested in the interconnectivity of, of everything, of life, synchronicities. I've always had a ton of synchronicities. Like, oh, wow, wow, wow. Uh, so I'm like, everything's interconnected. I had that sense of it. And these came out, started coming out in 2015, and that's when the spiritual awakening really kicked in. So these... The stargates have guided me as I've gone through digging deeper and expanding my consciousness and awareness and going through the spiritual benchmarks. Uh, and I'm a conduit because all glory is spirit. Uh, and so that energy signature that I achieve, it, it's, becomes automatic in my own energy field and the paintings are an extension of that. So it becomes automatic in the paintings as well. So the viewer can observe and appreciate and look at the, the paintings um, and through an energetic system of, of exchange, they'll receive what serves their highest good. And it always goes with free will. Uh, nothing is infringed upon. Uh, and it helps people uplift and empower, which leads to healing, which is the goal. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Was this always your goal? Did you did you realize this at some point? I mean, how how have your goals shifted? Because in Banff, it seems like uh, your goal was experiencing it all. Yeah, no, that's that's a good way to put it. Um, when the spiritual awakening kicked in. I started to explore different avenues of spirituality. And that, that brings me back to what you were mentioning about trying different podcasts, trying different teachers, like just trying stuff out as an individual. That's definitely part of the path. Like, and even if you did go join a club, you would have that experience to know, or, you know, some sort of society. You, you would have that to, to learn from because earth is a school of duality learning and you can't have the light without the dark. Mm. So it's really great to try all different types of, of stuff out to see what's going to work subjectively for the individual. Um, and that's part of becoming your own leader from within rather than following like a guru or somebody outside of yourself dictating you instructions. You, it's, and it's, it's hard for people. A lot of people really in, would, prefer that and now it's turning the tables have turned and it's more of a from within and paving your own path and trying different spiritual avenues uh, educational avenues and finding out what resonates the most with you as an individual so everyone's kind of like building their own their own way mm. blocks yeah, and it's it's like a resorting or a reorganizing of the 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 systems. That's what we're we're going through. It feels chaotic, but I think things like you know uh, digital currency, cryptocurrency are making way for this new interactive space 
uh, mm -hmm. on the internet where there isn't a middleman and it's pure mm -hmm. peer to peer, you know, which I tend to think is pure, right? It's pure when you go peer to peer. It's not being diluted by someone else's rules, someone else's agenda, someone else's schemes even. I mean, yeah. this Zoom call is being diluted by Zoom's scheme to make money off of me. You know, I mean, essentially, uh, this could be better if Zoom wasn't charging me $20 a month. I don't know. Bad example, maybe. But you see uh, this sort of Aquarian energy expressing mm. itself through technology. I wonder if we're going to hit a brink where, you know, technology becomes more about consciousness and less about utility, less about what we can do with it in the physical world. And I think art has always been consciousness based. Mm -hmm. Any innovations in the art space are typically consciousness based. Do you think we're moving towards that as a whole in this age of Aquarius, a more fluid sort of conscious first society? Well, uh, life is a mirror. It's a, reflection of your level of consciousness and as a collective it's a reflection of uh, how we are as a group so we have some we have some progress to come but uh yeah i think the more that people empower themselves and learn to trust their intuition that will reflect back to them through how life unfolds through opportunities and circumstances and in the physical so it yeah it will sh it will shift it will be more of a responsible society. I learn people will learn how to take responsibility for their actions when they learn what karma is, which is cause and effect, and what you say about somebody else is a reflection of what you think about yourself. So the more calm you keep your energy field and neutral, the higher your vibration goes, um, and the more that we build bridges, we'll find more things in common that we can build together upon so that the people are actually served in the system and less of it's the clash and conflict all the time because it's you know duality is difficult um so once people start to learn and be educated about these spiritual truths I think it'll be a, a big shift more and more well and what was your next step after the Banff experience, because I think we have had people reach out to this show. I, myself, and people we've had on the show who've had a similar experience of awakening, but they might not have the guidance or the process in mind to know what to do next. So what came next for you? Uh, well, I'd say, you know, that was that period of time was a lot of shifting in my life. And then once I got to the third initiation, that's when it got really more clear about what was happening. And I was, I study a lot. Like I study different avenues of, of spiritual teachers, not just one leader or one uh, type of education um, curriculum. So I, I just started looking at a lot of different uh, esoteric material and meditation, different meditation types, uh, and that quickens the process as well. Uh, signs and symbols have such an impact on the subconscious mind and uh, on our daily lives and how we take action. It's just so fascinating. So I studied a lot of that, and I was trying different meditations and um in the spiritual awakening, I mean, really, it's something that's pre-programmed in. Um, my natal chart really was a great, like I had it, it read, um, and it, it's been a really great blueprint uh, for me to understand different ways why my life is unfolding in certain ways. Uh, that's been a really great help. Uh, it's a, it's a very tense process as well like it's not blissful all the time it's actually really hard <laughs> uh and not everyone has to go through the full thing but uh it's it's a lot of tension and spiritual lessons 
because spirit wants uh, to test the individual to make sure they're trustworthy of the mysteries, of learning the mysteries, because if you are in service to self in this new era, you can't go above a certain level, which is level six, the tomb. And that's what humanity has been congested in for for probably the, you know, I don't know how long, but for a very, very long time. And it's very fear-based. It's a very dense energy. Uh, so unless you're service to humanity, uh, which also serves self, then you can't go, then you can't ascend. And once you ascend, uh, your energy signature is dominant. Right. So uh, I, I don't know. Could I be, is there like more of a way I could be more specific? Um, well, I think I just want to highlight like something that came up in a previous conversation that maybe will help listeners uh, understand what you're saying. So we talked to David Elkington and he described the holographic nature of the universe. Could have been David or someone else, maybe Bob Frizzle. Actually, it was Bob Frizzle. And Bob said that, you know, if you cut a holograph in two, it's going to have a smaller half size image of the whole holograph. It's not going to be the holograph cut in half, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. a half version of that and so on and so forth, no matter how many times you divide it. I like to think of human beings incarnating as maybe like a 16th of what they could be, right? They're, they're just the 16th of that. And as they grow the, throughout life, they become more and more of the whole hologram that was, you know, in their natal chart. You sort of can get hints of what that is. And each human being can see, visualize, can see the, what their future, what their destiny is like if they really are tapped in and connected to that. Uh, but I think we all have that holograph, that blueprint, as you put it, inside yeah. of us. So maybe to help illustrate that diagram a little bit more, you mentioned there's sort of like the first initiation, the second, the third, the fourth. Is this a, something that you can sort of lay out point by point for us? Well, the third initiation is the uh, transfiguration which is you merge with your higher self. And it's it's like a gradual process. You go through different tests each day that lead to like a, a big test where this huge energy upgrade comes in. And uh, the third eye gets very activated and the crown chakra, um, it's like this uh, Big energy upgrade. I don't know how to describe it. It's a very subjective experience. Uh, the third initiation, that's when you learn to overcome the, the physical and you, you merge with your higher self. And then you go through a series of more, it's all a spiritual tests. Every, every single thing is a spiritual test. And there's a lot of tension because you're going um, the path of most resistance. So it's things that your ego doesn't want to accept, but the higher self um, can see the bigger picture and wants you to learn that lesson. And once you overcome that lesson, you're super empowered and you're strong and you can help others go through it because you've overcome it. So a lot of the tests are, are about experience and overcoming conflict so that you can help others go through it as well. So that's all in my energy signature uh, and, and in my paintings, I don't, I don't try not to get too specific about what my tests were because I don't want to deter somebody from going on the path. Uh, cause it's a very individual process and you, you have to face your fears. So that's mm. not fun, but then you get to the other side of it and, um, wow, this is, a this is the truth. I'm, super empowered, you know, like you can see through the illusion more, the veil's been lifted more. Uh, so it gets, it, the tests don't get easier, but you become stronger as a person and you can, you can overcome it. Uh, so it's very, very empowering. And the third, so the third initiation is the transfiguration. And I, I didn't grow up religious. I came to this spiritual awakening with a fresh palate, um, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, and so I'm inclusive with my words. Uh, the I will say the Christ is a way shower. 
And so what he went through on the physical plane in the old era, uh, people are going through now on the plane of mind. Um, so it's not, you don't go through the physical crucifixion. Um, but you go, the fourth is a cosmic type of crucifixion and you just energy, just your life is gets really narrowed down it's called threading the needle. Um, you, the ener your energy is completely depleted. It's, it's pretty rough. Um, but it's all about like learning to save yourself, um, and carry a burden and overcome that burden. Um, the fifth and the sixth initiation are the, the cave part. I, I call it cave, but it's the tomb. Um, and so your ener the energy is super depleted. Life is really narrowed down. It's like being in a cave. That's, that's why I call it that, um, or a tomb. Uh, and basically, it's, it's really just a uh, creepy clown world is how I describe it. And this is where humanity is congested in right now five and six it's it's death energy basically so it's pretty gross um energetically this is all on the plane of mind like uh you have to pull yourself out of it like i had to say to myself i choose to get out of this this is an illusion i'm not afraid i'm i'm gonna uh, get out of this death energy <laughs> and i did <laughs> and uh so that's like six when you when you figure it out like this is just an illusion and uh there's more to go and there's nothing to be afraid of uh and then uh you keep getting your energy back uh and then the ascension happens and um yeah then you could get some real work done because the energy signature is dominant um because spirit is unconditional love and the people that practice or that are uh, the people that practice the dark arts don't know how to unconditionally love and they can't ascend. So as more people ascend in humanity, the, there'll be more dominance over the older, um, darker system. If you want to call it that evil system. I don't know. It's energy is neutral. It's how you direct it. So when I do my spiritual energy work, I work to uplift everybody. I, I don't say, oh, these people or these people. I, I say, let's uplift everybody so we can all build bridges and make a better world for everybody. So uh, yeah. I just try to put it in terms that people can relate to. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's extremely relatable. I appreciate the point you made about everybody's path being an individual one. And mm -hmm. you are so entitled to your privacy. I wouldn't ask about those types of experiences. I myself have had a series of experiences that I've only said so much about on podcasts because part of what I personally uh, believe is that these moments are ours to uh, appreciate and not expose, right? Because... Yeah. Yes, there is a time and a place. Yes, there are people who deserve to know. But for the most part, when you share these sort of really personal spiritual experiences, yeah. you're kind of doing the wrong. You're kind of being irresponsible with it, right? Like the point is to keep it to yourself and, and, and keep it special, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a lot of the spiritual path as well. So being able to speak even about this part publicly is a it's new, but it feels good. And it feels like, uh, if I were to share the specifics of my initiations, it wouldn't be relatable. Like, so, uh, speaking about the, the basic structure though, and that it can be accomplished. Uh, I think this is what I'm getting picking up now from spirit is how I'm gaining strength for the next benchmark rather than before it's all been keep it close and don't talk about the details and um, all this energy upgrades from within. But now there's something going on about being public about it. Mm. So it's exciting. Yeah, no, I sense that. I think that's important, especially because we need more authentic voices in this space. Unfortunately, okay. there are still holdovers from that world of cult spirituality and, and people yeah. are you know, pulled into that 
trap, you know? And well, I, I personally think that we've all kind of been in this huge human collective humanity cult <laughs> that we didn't know. <laughs> and people are waking up to the power dynamic and the structure and more of the, like the other side of things that it, the, the, the exoteric, what we're shown happening isn't what's going on all the time. There's a kind of a inner world happening that mm. the public's waking up to now so that we can reconfigure and make a, a power structure um, that serves humanity more. But um, right. well, we'll do- so we're all kind of coming out of a, a big cult. <laughs> yeah. And I would like the other little cults happening, but I would ask you, you know, do you think, cause we've had many different researchers on this show talk about the, you know, cryptocracy or these occult orders who control the world. Do you think they conditioned us in a way through this process? Like they, they kept us in this cult mentality in order to maybe keep us on level one so that they could be at level six, obviously not able to ascend to seven because they're so trapped in the, you know, whatever six's inversion is. But they kind of knew that, okay, we can be more powerful than them if we keep them in ignorance. We just can't let them know how we got to six because then they'll get to seven and beat us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's the energy of the old era. There's different rays of energy that come into play as well. So there's different rays that are uh, being integrated into the collective that are less dense um, and have a different type of uh, algorithm to them. So the, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can explain the, the narrative of the old era. Uh, the you could call it a matrix. You can call it uh, like a stolen matrix where the codes have been um, tricked out so that it keeps people in their, their lower chakras so that we can't achieve the ascension. Uh, you could describe it as a learning period where that just the, the grander cycle that we're in, um, you have to have the dark to see the light, uh, just a learning cycle. Uh the age of Pisces is about following a leader, having a school of fish. So it, all of that lends to how the power structure has been playing out the last 2000 years beyond. Um, and linear time doesn't really exist anyway. So uh, <laughs> I think we're all, we're all one collective. So they, them is also us. It's what the larger collective has allowed for on some level subconscious or conscious uh the energies were been really dense i mean the 3d is dense uh earth is a really hard learning school too so we've as a collective we've been trapped in the lower chakras definitely it's in the design of all the symbols that we see in advertising and words and now the energy is expanding to the crown chakra. It's, I think it's just timing. Um, people standing up for their, their, like their own empowerment, um, people being able to become their own leader and not relying on somebody outside of themselves. So all these different pieces come into play. Yeah. It seems like there's... Um... A sort of symmetry between the levels of initiation and what we would consider our seven chakras. Do you see it like that? Like you're sort of you you have certain people who are root chakra conscious. They're sort of in that survival fear mode, and yeah. then maybe they evolve to the creative sexual expression mode, but that can also, you know, lead to, to maybe downsides too, if you don't integrate that into the third and right, this sort of upward momentum rather than a downward spiral. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I'd say for the most part, uh, people have been stuck in the, the root, fear-based well i mean root doesn't have to be fear-based but uh survival mode um because we have humanity people haven't known their own power we're not taught this stuff in school the the veil has been thick you know uh 
So we're all learning and we're all here to uplift each other and not point fingers and just not to judge, to understand we haven't been exposed to higher truths on such a large scale ever before uh, because it's been suppressed. Um, some people could describe it as there was uh, like the, the Christ energy came in and then made it this twin dualistic system where there's like you're half half good, half half bad. I, I mean, I've heard it described like that before. Um, I try to, I'm inclusive. Like I try to just use different wording and um, ways of, of explaining it. But the, the Christ energy came and now we're moving into a Christ consciousness, which is all about heart chakra and um, being nice to one, one another. And uh, it's an energy. Yeah, it's... Um, it's exciting though that we're gonna we're getting out of it because it's been a long time coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it does feel like these things sort of show themselves uh, on a maybe downswing and then an upswing, right? So you get the sort of uh, lesser expression of the energy and then the h highest expression of the energy is sort of like oscillates back and forth. Yeah, and. When uh, in the on the ascension path, that's what you learn to balance is the duality. Mm -hmm. So instead of it swinging back and forth so much, you can kind of like pick up both sides and, and blend it together um, and uplift everybody, uplift the whole system instead of having it swing back and forth. Well, and how do you have any advice on how to do that? I mean, I feel like I've. I'm a victim of duality <laughs> to some extent. I, I think I, I've overcome it in some aspects, but, you know, as we reach that next plateau, there are new challenges to face, it feels. Yeah, and we'd be so bored if there wasn't new challenges as well. So I try to keep that in mind. Uh, I'm a visual thinker. I'm a spatial thinker. So I get a lot of images um, that help me focus my energy in certain ways um, or certain words uh, that I can direct my energy towards that will cr like create that momentum to push through the, that conflict, like that dualistic conflict, like we're in harmony through conflicts. That's the energy of earth. So if you work, and it's, it serves that way because the tension creates the momentum to move forward. And so I just think of it as this tension from two sides. And I choose a, a shape or a word to keep repeating my energy on. And it will break through that contrast to the next level. That's how I work. I, it's very visual yeah. for me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's why there's so much tension in the spiritual process because it's creating that momentum to the next level. Mm. Keep going up, and up, and up, and up. Well, and what would you say to people who maybe have no sense of that? Because I, I would imagine there are people who have a sort of muted idea of what spirituality is thanks to like the commercialization of things like yoga and meditation, you know, they've been commodified. Some people think like, oh yeah, I'll just relax and that's meditation. Uh, not really with a, a plan in mind, sort of just sitting there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all good. And people go at their own pace. There's no pressure to go too too fast um too much that's not good for the physical you have to go step by step for what's appropriate for the individual and the higher self will guide that uh, the higher self accepts what's appropriate for the lower self or the ego or the personality um everyone goes at their own pace and that's appropriate because if you go too fast like your physical body can't handle it first of all and then also it's a lot on the psyche as well because we've all had our programming we all have had uh, you know shadow work that we have to work through um which is kind of going through old memories working stuff out um that's what i call shadow work because emotions and memories and it all affects the physical like it's all intertwined uh, the 
the physical body, emotional body, and plane of mind. So you have to work through a lot of stuff and you go at your own pace. And you, as in the new era, when you're your own teacher from within, your higher self will guide you. So you try, you can try a meditation and see if that works for you. You try yoga and then more and more will keep unfolding. It'll get deeper and deeper as like you clear out what no longer serves and raise your vibration and trust the process and the higher self will guide. Um, I, I studied uh, some esoteric um, specific meditation, which quickens the process, but not everyone's supposed to quicken it either. So meditation can be hiking. I mean, I walk around in the city all the time and I repeat words in my head as a way of walking meditation. You can meditate by having no thought. Um, you can meditate in all, all different ways. So it's really, you don't have to be so rigid about it. It's, mm. it's, that's the beauty of it too. Yeah. I agree with you on hiking and walking meditations. I do them both. I have a way of uh, hiking that I just try to sync up my breath with my footsteps. You know, it doesn't have to be the same pace. It really just depends on what kind of energy I have that day. But I try to yeah. sync my footsteps up with my breathing pattern. And I find that that's a really uh, easy way to get out of my normal thought process and into a uh, meditative state. Yeah, it's really... Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. You're getting a call. <laughs> Uh, there we go. All set. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's yeah. all right. So, on the point about shadow work, where would you recommend people start? You know, I, I myself, I don't think I've really done uh, shadow work proper. Maybe I've done it accidentally or done it without knowing. That's what I was doing. But you know, how could someone start if they've never started something like this before? Uh, well, um. I love Reiki. I'm a Reiki master. So I think that's a great way to start to create momentum in your energy field and release things that you have congested um, in your body and your mind and your emotions. Maybe you don't even know about, but the Reiki um, process clears, starts the momentum to clear the energy field and then things will come up. So uh, it's, it's really amazing. Um, and as an, somebody that's gone through the ascension process, I have access to a higher spiritual energy, which is very, very difficult to obtain, to have that access. So with my Stargate artworks, um, I have the Reiki going, I have the higher ascended energy in there. And the paintings are a reflection of each viewer. So the viewer can receive those energies and, um, go about their their business and then see what comes up for them and see what new interests they may have. Or uh, it also could help the viewer to, if there's going through a specific challenge, the Reiki will guide, uh, and Reiki is universal healing energy. Uh, it's a consciousness. Uh, it will help guide that individual to find the right doctor to go to or the right experience, the right travel location, you know, the, the right person to meet, the right contact. Um, it opens up um, so many opportunities uh, for an upgrade in life. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, West Haven, but it's technically a part of New Haven. And there's a, a Campbell Avenue in West Haven where there are two really amazing um, stores that have changed my life. One of them is very well-known, Curious Goods. They sort of sell crystals and things. And then down the street a little further north is a place called Herbs and Stuff. And a woman who worked there named uh, Glenish, I haven't been in in a while, so I don't know if she's still there, but Glenish changed my life with a Reiki session. I was like 17 oh, years old. I, I oh. 17 Wow, so I was very that's young. Yeah, yeah, very young. I was also very heartbroken at the time. And I was going there to like basically clear that out, you know. 
yeah. had this these emotional sort of troubles I wasn't able to to deal with and I think that in hindsight that you know emotional thing was very minimal compared to what actually was now that you're what you're saying you know I'm sort of reflecting on it I would imagine that you know a lot of the things that I attributed to to cannabis like wiping the slate clean was jump started with that Reiki sex session because after that uh, I met a person who um, ended up really introducing me to a lot of new concepts. I mean, not that I'm a follower of Esther Hicks anymore, but mm -hmm. at the time the law of attraction material was so uh, important for me to understand because I was very, I was very self-defeating. You know, I, when I was younger, I had a very uh, can't mm -hmm. dialect, you know, I would speak in like ways where it was very, you know, negative towards myself, negative towards my peers. And I didn't realize it. I'd just been raised with this sort of languaging and yeah. that all started to really very get sarcastic. Right. Uh, yeah. I had to, we learn that as well. So well, and it's 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 Connecticut, it's New England. We have that sort of energy here, where yeah. people are just like they're sort of beaten down by their work, but they're proud of it, you know. So they're not like they're not like ashamed of the fact that they don't take like vacations and and stuff. They love the fact that they work hard. It's it's like yeah. this earned misery that that really <laughs> helps people, you know, forget about spirituality. Unfortunately, and I think. That's part of why my family thinks I'm crazy because of, of these experiences that gravitated me away from maybe what my path was going to be if I didn't do that. So I, I totally recommend Reiki. But when it comes to, you know, universal life energy, um, it's not just a Japanese practice, right? I mean, we, we, we see people doing energy healing all over the world. Reiki just seems to be uh, one of the more precise ways to mm -hmm. uh, interact with our energy fields. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And there's different lineages. I studied the Japanese lineage and then there's different like, kind of ways you can add on to it um, with quantum healing and different uh, specifics. Uh, like some people are just focused on Reiki for, for pets and, there's different like uh, land healing techniques. Um, I think the Japanese, I love the Japanese lineage. It's really powerful, it's really precise. And I've gotten very precise as I've gone through the ascension process as well. It's, it's automatic in my energy fields. Um, the, every, all of the spiritual lessons that I learned uh, so it gets easier in the sense that you don't have to re like, I don't have to repeat myself so much. I don't have to do as much meditation. Um, a lot of energy is through visual through the eyes actually. So you can just kind of look at something. Um, and, uh, uplift it. <laughs> it all has to do, uh, with the, the energy fields. Um, Reiki is amazing though, and it is precise. Uh, and I'm glad that more people are opening up to it now and um, learning about uh, alternative healing te techniques and holistic healing. And part of the new era is the merge of Western medicine with Eastern medicine, because I appreciate Western medicine, you know, as well. I think the two together could really help people. Wow. Yeah. I know I, I certainly trust hospitals when it comes to fixing my leg. I don't know about fixing my mind or my soul, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting. And that, and people are just starting now to learn that your thoughts affect your physiology. And so if you change your mindset, you can upgrade your health as well. So it's like a new, everything is, it seems so makes so much sense, but it's still something that people are just starting to wake up to now. Yeah. Well, I think we've been taught in this materialistic way. So this sort of stuff is counterintuitive, you know, like our intuition when we're growing up is very 
open to all this stuff, but then through schooling, we become these little mathematician scientist thinkers. They're like these little, you know, physical science, you know, becomes the, the main outlook. And then it's only until, you know, later in life that a lot of people wake up from that. I think it's, it's inverted in other parts of the country too, where you have a more, you know, traditional, we'll say, or a more, uh, whichever religion it is, a more um, strict upbringing, sticking to, to religious teaching, you know. Um, I don't know if Reiki would work for someone like that because they've had like a wall put up between them and anything that's not, you know, Christian or Islamic or, you know, insert your religion here. I mean, yeah. what do you say to, to people who maybe were born in, in like traditional environments like that and, and aren't sure how to make their way out of it? The beauty about being um, a Reiki master is uh, you go through training. I've gone through the training to, to be inclusive and work with whatever's going to uh, resonate with that individual on a soul level and it's all accepted by the higher self so it, it doesn't go against free will so if, if i've had clients that um are from traditional backgrounds and i just learned to work with um, what they relate to and what they connect to um, by calling in certain um spiritual energies as i do the reiki process right. so it it and you don't have to believe in it for it to work. Like <laughs> it works. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> the higher self is, so it's, it doesn't infringe on free will. Um, and it's a step-by-step step. it's, you know, it's gradual. It's, uh, it, it's universal. So it doesn't matter what religion you might come from or not come from. Uh, it, it's a higher self acceptance that will lead that person to an, an avenue that will upgrade their life on whatever terms is appropriate for them, whatever's in their natal chart, whatever their higher self is guiding them to. Right. It's, everyone has their individual path. Absolutely. Yeah. And this seems to be, you know, um, agreeable with everybody's outlook. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's really, a, <laughs> unless we go back 400 years to, like the Protestants in New England who would call me a witch for doing Reiki. Uh, <laughs> I, I think most of that is, has been sort of, you know, past, right? This, again, we're, we're entering into a new mindset. People are, yeah. are gravitating away from that old cult-like mindset. But you mentioned at the beginning that you uh, have done distance Reiki, uh, yeah. and, and not on a, on a person, but on a place itself. Can you talk about that elaborate on how something like that would work like what what are you what are you physically doing like visualizing the place sending energy how does that work um yeah and just to quickly mention the lineage reiki japanese lineage is is has been um prominent and people know about it but energy healing has been around for way longer than that. And I think it's something that it just resonates on a soul level about like, it's possible, like deep down people are like, wow, oh, this like, this is uh, more truth in this than um, I consciously know. So um, the distance Reiki uh, you send through the etheric web and there's a way to call the, the energy body of that person or that, uh, specific location um, through the etheric web. And that's something you learn as a Reiki master that I, I wouldn't want to give that away. Um, but you're able to call that energy body and it works with land as well. It, it's, you can sense where the chakras are of, of what you're calling up. So it kind of works in that way. There's, um, a formula to it. Um, but that, that I learned in my Reiki training. So I don't want to talk too much about that. The ascension process is my individual. So I, I can be more open about that. Yeah. No, well, and it is a quite extensive process to become, you know, adept at Reiki. So I think people who are interested, they should, you know, seek out someone to learn that from and, you know, 
compensate that person, right? We don't want to give away too many uh, secrets. Well, it's, it's the lineage, so I don't want to, you know. Right, right, right. Maybe with the lineage that it's not, you know. Well, Bru- Bruce Lee, uh, according to some conspiracy theories, Bruce Lee was struck down for that exact reason. Maybe not Reiki, but he, he divulged uh, his martial arts lineage and and some people didn't like that you know so to speak but yeah 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 it's, it's spirit guided me to be it's not like that mysterious either so i don't want to like right. build it up or something <laughs> well i <laughs> wanted to ask you about new haven itself so maybe okay. this this will be outside of the lines of of the lineage but when you were doing the distance healing yeah. on new haven like what did you interpret? Are there certain spots in New Haven that came to mind? Um, you know, what, what, what was your, what's your take on New Haven? Yeah, well, I'm, so distance Reiki, um, you send through the etheric web and with any sort of Reiki session, you, it's better to go for three times or more than one time because the momentum, uh, clearing out your energy field, it, it takes a little bit like one session is great, but if you could do three, that really pushes, pushes it forward, whatever's been congested in there. So I did three distance Reiki sessions and I, I included New Haven, uh, Yale and the Stone Bones Club. Uh, and I called the spirit of Geronimo in to help. Um, and I just did it with the intention of clearing out old, energies that no longer serve and to serve the highest good of all involved. Uh, very, very basic because I, I wasn't looking for specifics or anything like that, just to get the congested energy of New Haven out. Like there's a lot of history there and it's, it's just kind of this mucky <laughs> energy. Um, so that's what I worked on and I did three sessions the let's see there's a lot of transitioning happening now um in in the area that's what i picked up on there's a lot of new energies being integrated i could tell by the way the chakras um in the energy field were bouncing all over the place it was very active so i worked on on balancing that out um and that's because this this a new energy is moving in there. There's a ton of light. Like I just saw light, like a switch went on. Um because I get I part of my process is getting a lot of visuals. And then I, it's like this understanding that happens once I see it. Um and you get sensations in your body too, like you pick up on stuff. Uh so that was cool. It was a kind of a frantic energy, um, new integrations, a lot of light. I saw like this lava type material, like the core, something at the core is shifting. So that was cool. Uh, and I just, I did, I did the same setup the three times just for the momentum. There's a lot of expansion happening. Uh, objects bursting apart. is is cool it's shifting and there's a lot of resistance to it as well like um and this is you know abstract terms i work for to uplift everybody uh yeah no no i i i I understand and i'm sort of visualizing like some things that i've seen over the past few months in new haven that correspond with what you're saying like for for example the past year and a half i believe the Peabody Museum has been under construction and behind it for the past three or four years, they've been building uh, an addition to the science portion, like the chemistry portion of the Yale campus. And they're creating this like large tower. It's on a, already an elevated part of the, the, you know, land. And it's, it's interesting because when, we were researching the history of New Haven. It turned out that everything sort of north uh, towards the Quinnipiac River, what's now East Rock and everything north of East Rock, uh, like sort of Southern Hamden, that would have been where the Quinnipiac natives lived and, um, and the settlers would have considered that whole area like the, you know, 
rough woods. Like this was dangerous. Don't go there. And then they have this sort of Albertus Magnus College. Albertus Magnus being a sort of occultist and alchemist, someone who believed in ascension. Oh yeah. yeah. And, and so in my mind, that energy is on that hill. That's why they have the divinity school. They have the science school. All of this stuff is sort of like built on that hill for a reason. So now you have this tower coming out and it's right next to the Peabody museum, which is also under construction. Why is that important? Well, they have enormous crystals inside of the Peabody museum uh, oh, I don't. Nice. I don't think they. I remember that. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Yeah, I don't know if that they are like moving them somewhere else or if they're going to stay there permanently. But enormous crystals in the Peabody Museum, and also, of course, a lot of uh, Native American artifacts in the Peabody Museum as well. Hence the you know yeah. that activity in the area. So that is interesting when you talk about things like coming apart and reforming like yeah. lava kind of like is like the the pure matter of the earth. It's like spit out at its highest yeah. vibrational state and then cools, or, you know. Yeah. 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 Um, the Reiki is a conduit for Reiki. It's a consciousness and it, it knows where to go. Mm. So I was I was very um Every single session was about the New Haven Green campus and school and bones <laughs> needed a lot of Reiki. So that's what I, that's what mo mainly what I was working on. Um, but, you know, I feel like this is so, uh, we were meant to come together and discuss this and uh, to do this energy work, I think was uh, something that was, part of my path, you know? Um, so I'll, I, I think I might keep it up too. maybe do some other areas as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I would love to, uh, learn more. Obviously it's something that people have to, to seek out themselves, um, to become a Reiki master, but you know, uh, I'd be interested in, in paying for, you know, a Reiki session myself, and then maybe learning a little bit about how I can, direct my energy uh in that way because it's it's not just cities that need our attention uh places like gunji Wamp, places like the calendar 2 site in vermont uh the uh Dight dighton rock in massachusetts i mean there are so many ancient sites here in new england that have been for really uh, worse or for better, maybe for better because they've been preserved in, in the in the absence of interest. But uh, archaeologists don't seem to be interested in these sites all across New England. And I think they play a big role in what we see going on. Uh, if we could maybe put caring, positive, loving attention back into those sacred spaces uh, yeah. the same way the natives did when they were prominent here, um, then we could maybe adjust some of that chaos that expresses itself in cities. Meanwhile, you have this like, you know, uh, just utter affluence only miles away. You know, it's, well, it's interesting. I, th I think that's why I was guided to focus on um, the areas that I focused on because it has been dominant and, um, uh, maybe had a strongholds on other sacred sites as well. So to flesh that, to start like integrating light into that, like a Christ consciousness or a cosmic consciousness into that, which was what I picked up on, I think will help the whole area. Uh, because I'm sure there's a lot of ways that the energy there has been dominant um, in ways that are so ingrained in the fabric of the history you know the, the what's been going on um since the beginning yeah i didn't know that new haven was a colony i learned that on uh one of your podcasts mm -hmm. so i mean that's pretty important just to have it be this its own entity yeah uh, well so it's a it's failed a entity essentially i mean it it was uh, attempted it could have become a, its own state you know essentially i mean if it was a successful colony it would have been like 
you know, the Connecticut colony and had its own uh, state potentially. But yeah, they weren't very successful financially, even though they started off that way. And they had territory as far south as Philadelphia. So, you know, New yeah, Haven. That's crazy. Yeah, it's very well, it's 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 interesting to think about, oh, New Haven and Philadelphia were sort of the same place in that mm-hmm. sense, right? Because people in mm-hmm. Philadelphia recognize that they are a part of the colony of New Haven somehow. So, I mean, that just connects New Haven to the actual birth of this country in my mind yeah. which we don't right. really think of it like that we think of Stay it like on. you know yeah. Yale and and a little bit of an art scene and you know some good food and 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 that's it you know it doesn't really have you know a, a, an expression outside of Yale on an international scale the same way Philadelphia does yeah yeah that's true um the third at the third Reiki session um I just did it this morning as well. Uh, Well, the second one, the energy was completely depleted. The third one this morning, heart chakra tingles. So that is amazing. Like you can feel it at the heart chakra, all this tingling. And that's where the alchemy takes place through the blood. So there's a lot of change happening and a lot of grounding as well. I could tell. So we'll have to see what, you know, how the city transforms as we go forward on yeah, but, that's interesting. You said the first reading was about the green, second one about the college. I layered them all. There's ways you can call each energy oh, okay, okay, and then it, layer them it. and do them all at once. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. So, so, but when you said the second reading was sort of empty or hollow, what what do you mean by that? Well, you can sense like uh, when you when you sense to see how much energy a person has, how how far their org field is extending. Mm. If it's depleted, it's just like, like it drops Uh, down. Like no energy. Right, right. right. Yeah. Well, and, and I've always thought, you know, in some way Yale is kind of taking advantage of Connecticut in a way. Like they're like giving away all this energy for like people who come from other places and then they leave and they're not really invested. I mean, yeah, they're alumni, so they care about Yale, but they're not like invested in New Haven or Connecticut uh, as a, as a place. They're they're part of this like other thing. They're not a part of our community. Doctors stick around. (laughs) Yeah. They they definitely stick around. I agree. And that's, I've always felt that about this, the potential of New Haven uh, to, to kind of be a more of a welcoming place, uh, mm. more livable. Well, and uh, maybe that's why it's depleted, though, because it is sort of like giving itself up for this, like, other institution, you know? It, yeah, it, right. And that's, okay, so that's how, uh, like, a negative energy works as well, um, is it just it feeds on itself um it's it's a it absorbs um Mm. and i don't think yale is completely negative or or anything like that i just mean like if the dominant uh energy type is about absorption it just keeps feeding on itself and takes from its surroundings right right it's a give or take and and that's the duality the give or take so if you're if it could be like an energy vampire that's a a saying um it'll just keep taking and taking and taking there's no balance uh well so and, I guess that as a good uh analogy well there. and you you see that with the uh entities that collect themselves around you know, we have an fbi headquarter building we have banks you know more than one bank uh and we have uh pharmaceutical companies one of them is, is sort of building a new building now uh downtown where the coliseum used to be and, uh, oh, yeah. and, and yeah, it's, it's really interesting. My story started with New Haven going to school at uh, gateway, which is sort of okay. ironic because it was yeah. a gateway to all of this understanding. And you told us about your gateway, uh, your Stargate sort of yeah. work. Right. So, yeah. um, but it, yeah, it, it's interesting. Like I didn't know about Geronimo when I went to this college I didn't know about him for the first few months that I was there I had always loved Native American culture because I had a a family member uh, my sister's godfather one of my dad's really good friends who 
is a Native American from the area. And when we would go to his house, I was just always just stupefied by how cool like everything was you know you had furs on the wall it wasn't like a teepee it was a real you know it was a house uh, but he had cool stuff in it that was like his part of his life and his culture and it always really stuck with me and then I meet this guy who happens to be a Native American happens to be homeless happens to be in New Haven for Geronimo spirit and uh, and here I am 10 years later hearing about this heart energy and I yeah. mean, to me, it feels like, you know, the more I talk about Geronimo on podcasts, the more I express the love that I have for Geronimo, the more that is ha like, I don't want to aggrandize myself, but I feel like there are more people than 10 years ago focusing on this because of what I'm doing. You know, I could have gone the route of like a, 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 a street guy and like, stood in front of the tomb and protested and made a big scene there wouldn't have really been effective. Uh, but with this podcast, I can focus on all of these amazing interests and this thing that I've been passionate about for a long time now. So it's really, if it makes me feel really good to hear that. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I learned so much from your podcast about Geronimo. Um, and it, the history there with Yale that I didn't know about. So when I did the distance Reiki sessions, I call them the spirit of Geronimo uh, because it's such a, a beautiful warrior spirit. And we all need that warrior spirit right now to move into the new era. And I set the intention for him to uh, re resurrect his spirit and be in peace. That, that was what the quality that I worked with um, during these sessions. So. Mm. It's a uh, very special, yeah. And I, I think it's so meaningful because being from New Haven and then going through this spiritual process and then coming across your work and um, it just all kind of came together. Uh, so I think it's, I think it like adds another layer um, of meaning and importance and another step uh, to the new era. Mm, absolutely, and I. I've mentioned him before and I mentioned him in our message, but I encourage you to look into Peter shampoo because I think his work really uh, okay. corresponds with, with your approach to Reiki and, and how you see the world. Um, it's very interesting how his work synchronistically pushed me towards understanding a lot of this stuff. Uh, and then he actually put out a, a PDF specifically on New Haven uh, a few months ago after I, my second interview with him. And he oh, talked wow. about he talked about the East Rock and how East Rock has, uh, I think, the Lady of Peace. I forget her actual name, but uh, there's a statue of the Lady of Peace on on top of East Rock. Yeah, it's coming back to me. Yeah, I remember East Rock. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's also interesting is you're probably familiar with Sleeping Giant in Hamden. Yeah. <laughs> so the mountains that are known as East Rock and West Rock, they're technically a part of this same small mountain chain that Sleeping Giant is a part of. And okay. there are a number of sacred stone structures along this mountain chain. So New Haven for thousands of years has been a place where people have come uh, and, and done some sort of uh, spiritual ceremony. We don't know exactly the specifics, but we do know that Sleeping Giant gets its name because the natives believe that it was an actual giant who had fought uh, Ketan, who's sort of like a, a hero entity, hero spirit, uh, not quite like a a creator, but more of like the the sun, we can think of it. And Hobomoko and the sun fought, and uh, Hobomoko, the giant, died and became this mountain. <laughs> I didn't know that. It definitely looks like a, a giant that got turned into stone. <laughs> right. Well, and, cool well, and you have all this going on in this area. You have this dead giant, you know, Yale University's right there. And... I haven't found a direct link between the Smithsonian and Yale University yet, but my suspicion is, you know, they knew a lot about what Native Americans really were doing, and they tried to cover it all up, and, and that's one of the explanations for 
why they might have stolen Geronimo's skull and, and femur bones and hid them away in a basement. I don't think that means Geronimo was a giant and they were hiding his giant skeleton or something like that. Uh, but it, it definitely... Uh, it's definitely curious, you know. I don't know how far you go into the ancient American mystery stuff, but there's a lot of things that don't fit into what we're taught in school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Uh, definitely with a lot of different, with everything, basically. Mm, right, right. <laughs> the bones, um, there, there are like light codes or DNA codes that come out of the bones. And that might be a reason why they would want to capture somebody's bones. Wow. Uh, so they hold like a core of like the existence of uh, of source. Um, I know I go through um, ascension symptoms, and that's something moving forward. People are getting people are seeking healing now. Um, but more and more people are going to be seeking out healing, either from the side effects of the last few years or from ascension symptoms, which is your body starts releasing light codes, um, DNA codes. Uh, some people will call it junk DNA, but it's just, it's been dormant and now it's being activated. And it makes your body have these reactions um, because it's, the body, the physical is most dense, so it's adjusting to a higher frequency that's coming from the codes within, and uh, the bones hold like the core of source. Uh, so I know I go through a lot of um, I, my wrists. Uh, I think because I, I work with my hands, release a lot of codes. I could tell it's it's a, this feeling, um, and everyone has their their own process with it. But uh, I don't know much about, like, the practice that might happen behind closed doors, but the bones might be tied to the, trying to capture that life essence. Yeah. And wow. owning it. That's, that's fascinating. I, I want to ask you more about the light codes, but quick, I just want to point out you're absolutely right. Um, I'm trying to find the name of it, but... There's a type of uh, divination using bones that goes mm -hmm. back thousands of years, and it's even the reason why we have things like dice and, and dominoes and other little game pieces. It's all oh, yeah. sort of the, the white color, at least, would okay. be you know uh, from the original pieces, which were bones, which would have been white. So, yeah, they, yeah. they would use these sort of little bone pieces for divination they started to adapt those into games and that became what you know dice evolved from but yeah it's 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 certainly interesting to think of it in that context when you consider what some people do with dice like uh with these role-playing games where they use their imagination to create all these different realities and yeah um, yeah that's a good point like creator energy yeah and i wonder with the light codes like is this something that has been ramping up over the past few years and could that be why there's such an emphasis it seems to uh, for lack of a better word, uh, depopulate or, or force people to do things that go against their medical sovereignty? I I mean, they, that's nothing new to trick people. Right. Well, the, the thing is, this realm, can't, the law of free will stands. But if there's a power that can trick that free will and that person makes that choice, because um, it all comes down to choice, then it's not going against free will. So humanity has been tricked for, for ages and ages to do things that might not be in their best interest. Um, so also a lot of energy siphoning going on. Although I, I say, I, I pick up on the, the different signs, what's unfolding. Um, and there's been a, there's a bigger gap happening over the last few weeks between the duality. So that's, the siphoning of energy from, say, the, the side that um, takes all the time has been closed off. But previous to this, there's ways to trick the the energy body. And so they receive your energy through fear, basically. Um, I mean, this stuff is real. Like, uh, the people have been studying the esoteric arts 
for instance, the beginning. And there's people that choose to use it for service to sell, for service to others. And mostly people have been using it for service to sell up until this era. So they um, take from the collective through energy, through tricking free will in order to um, um, receive the the riches of, of this world, not the spiritual riches. So um, you could say it's a, a worship of material. That's one way to put it. Um, worship, you could call it evil, you could call it Moloch, you know, but it's basically about material right. um, and this world. Uh, and gaining all this worldly riches for one person rather than helping everyone, which lifts everybody up and yourself, like you benefit as well. Uh, that's service to others. And that's what we're moving into, what people are learning about. The tricking of free will though, as brutal, <laughs> but people have to learn that it comes down to a choice um, and empower themselves and make the choice for to see what's really happening um, to lift the veil and then it gets easier but it's hard it you know it's hard to it's a very well disguised dystopia that we've been in um, and now that's kind of more light is shedding upon the systems that have been in power and um, not really in service to people mm. so right. Right. Well said. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to see someone shine as bright as you from where you're shining in New York city. Cause at least on the comedy podcast I listen to, they're always making New York sound like the worst place to be. And I, you know, <laughs> growing up in Connecticut, I have fond memories of going to New York city on Christmas Eve or on new years and, oh, you know, just sort of being close enough to the city to visit and not close enough to have to stay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, knock on wood, where's some wood. Uh, <laughs> I, I've had uh, some great alignments being here and uh, spirits had me in training uh, for the last 15 plus years. Um, learning how to navigate this city, making contacts, gaining opportunities but not getting too too far in the field so i didn't have to compromise mm -hmm. and now that i've made these masterpieces of mine uh they've been such a long time in the making um to have them here now i could start to pursue going out and w learning the people that are going to be the right fit to work with um and where to show them and uh they're going to start helping more and more people because it's really difficult to access the higher spiritual energy. And that's how I just, I'm so confident. Like I, it's just, I just know it because of what I went through in order to <laughs> achieve it. So the thing I like about Connecticut and New York is I really do actually appreciate the work ethic. And I like the city because if you can handle all the pressure, you turn into a diamond. Uh, so that's like the challenge here. Uh, Pros and cons. Um, well said. Yeah, I mean, I have this this uh, paradox going where I love the West Coast, <laughs> but I have like this East Coast like uh, quick pace, <laughs> so I don't I'm too yeah. fast for that area mm. and neurotic. So uh, yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> that's the area we're from. What are you gonna do? Know thyself, right? <laughs> right. But yeah. So spirit has me stationed here because um, I have been able to achieve uh, the ascension and I have this spiritual ability. Um, not that I don't have more to go. There's always more to go. So I stay, always stay humble. But I think because I was able to do this um, and it's a very dense energy here, I'm here to help uplift. So it doesn't completely go off the rails. Mm. Right. Yeah. I think so many people have this impression that you have to go to other countries, fly across the ocean to go experience, you know, great, amazing spiritual wonders. And no, New York State, Connecticut, New England, we have these amazing places 
there waiting for people to experience, you know, and, and New York City, I think, is, as you said, that pressure cooker of all of those forces, boom, right there. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, we have all of the different river systems that lead down through the, the East Coast that are so important and have a, a life of their own. Um, my girlfriend and I went up to um, Woodstock, New York, after talking to someone named Aurora, who was on the show uh, almost 200 episodes ago now. She was one of our earlier guests, and she discussed the energy vortex that's going on up there in the Catskill Mountains. Oh, interesting. Yeah, wow. and I've, I've felt it, you know, traveling through there, and we found some really incredible books that helped us understand more about Connecticut just from going on that little trip. And, uh, yeah, I think there's a, a radiating energy from there that affects New York City. I mean, Mount Shasta gets a lot of, uh, of interest, you know, in the United States as being a holy mountain, but the natives that lived along the Hudson River, they called uh, the Catskill Mountains uh, 12 Steps to Heaven, and the wall of the Manitou, which sort of mean the same thing. But um, the idea was that you would be sort of tested by how, which peak you could get to. So there was a series of 12 peaks, you know, and only the, the brightest, toughest, strongest, most gifted would make it to the 12th, you know, the top, yeah. right? Yeah. And is this sort of like this spiritual idea of the 12 signs, or even, um, you know, the seven chakras of, you know, ascension or seven steps to ascension. This idea of, of you know, the rite of passage, which really isn't in our society anymore. We don't have a sort of rite of passage outside of like having your first drink, you know. <laughs> uh, the climbing the mountains is a great metaphor as well for what goes on on the plane of mind. Um when in when you're in the ascension process as well because each benchmark is like a mountaintop that you reach mm. uh, keep going to the highest one that you can yeah well, that makes perfect sense and this area definitely has a lot to offer uh and it's so interesting to learn more about it because mm. it feels like more and more is going to start to come and uh, new york certainly has a lot of international activity going on as well so kind of uh brings in a lot from all over the world and um the states is this country that just has a lot of opportunity there's a lot of things that need to be restructured in order to serve the people but uh connecticut and new york uh, connecticut's the constitution state it's got that vibe going to it. This is the place where we're going to build the new era. So mm. it's really pretty special. Agreed. Now, yeah. when you're doing a sort of distance healing or reading, uh, do you do a natal chart for a location? Have you ever considered doing that? Because I've, from what I've researched, New Haven has a sort of Saturnian energy, but that's only a planet not a, a sign do you know if it's like uh pisces or if, if new haven's a virgo like what what, what are your thoughts on that <laughs> it's libra it's <laughs> off the top of my head um but i i don't read natal charts uh, there are very talented people out there that that do do that um i my chakras are are pretty open my crown chakra it's i have this it, just it's a quick knowing um so it's very intuitive i just kind of can tell um yeah. it's hard to put into words because it's energy you know mm, right and energy always reads stuff first before you can put words to it the words are kind of filter out a little bit of the energy response but new haven um Saturnian, yeah, that's kind of what the whole structure of, of old era is, is built on. Mm. And we just had this uh, constellation happen. Um, 
So last Christmas where Saturn and Jupiter made this V in the sky and then started to go the other way. So, so Jupiter overtook Saturn now. Um, and my stargates are linked to Jupiter through the sun. Like they're actual portals. I saw into the deep depths of the universe the first time like an actual portal came out. Um, and then it integrates the energy. So uh, anyway, that was cool. Uh, Jupiter overtook Saturn. So even if New Haven was built on Saturn, it, it's going to be restructured now to Jupiter. Wow. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's good to know. Now, Jupiter's you... the um, crown chakra of our universe. Right. Uh, and the plane of mind, the king. It's the king of the universe. So, huh. uh, yeah. So, this you, it's all part of the process. Like, if you think of it abstractly, um, that old structure, maybe people thought that was the right thing to do at the time, even though someone else might have a different perspective. Um, I prefer the Jupiter <laughs> structure. So. Mm. Well, and it seems like it's a, a process of uh, evolution or progression, you know, from one yeah. s- stage yeah. to the next in this grand cycle that repeats itself. I, I think the people who plotted out the New Haven nine square grid were trying to maybe just follow customs that were set by, you know, older folks, yeah. you know, from Europe. And, and that goes interpretively i don't know how true or accurate this is but people interpret it being connected to the temple of solomon anytime you see that nine grid in a piece of architecture or city structure it's you know hinting at the the temple of solomon which is supposed to be built into the divine proportions of a man or of of a human right okay all right um yeah i'm not too familiar with that the Solomon, um, the the New Haven grid. What I learned from your podcast about the nine squares really fascinated me because I didn't know that, and I made my ascension with nine these nine stargates. Um, there's two behind me, but there's mm. there's nine that I've been working on the last like two and a half three years because it's a process of layering fabric and pulling back uh, construction deconstruction construction. That's that's how I built the portal. It's very supernatural. Um, as well, like part of the process. Uh, so the nine, I mean, that's a pretty big spiritual number. And to have the nine stargates and then to learn about the nine squares on the green, like the duality, there's always two sides. Um, and the goal is to walk the middle path of that. Maybe when they designed New Haven, that was like the best they they could do, and maybe that had to happen in order to get to the to the Jupiter structure. Now, mm. um, I don't know. I just started like throwing around different ideas. Yeah, when I learned that it was pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you sort of bouncing ideas back and forth with me about New Haven. Um, I plan on using part of this in a project that we're working on about New Haven, uh, as okay. well as this being a, an episode of the My Family Thinks Some Crazy podcast. So people listening who are like, who cares about New Haven? I live in Canada or wherever you live. Just stick with us here, right? Because the point is, is New Haven is is an example. And, and wherever you live, you can use sort of the techniques we're describing or the methods we're describing to find out more about wherever you live and if that place happens to be more interesting well let me know because i'd love to learn about it but yeah when it comes to the portals and there being nine of them was that something that intuitively came to you did you know that nine was such an important number uh, out there well the second house i i lived at was number is number nine but uh <laughs> and then you know there's that Beatles song number nine number nine um so it's the numbers then on my radar. Uh, making these these nine that I did the ascension with, I mean, they're ahead of me. There's no way I could have come up with this without spirit guidance. Um, I have been working on these since 2019 um, when everything closed down. And that's when I got really into hermit mode and narrowed down and thread the needle. That was that section of the the benchmarks the five and six the tomb part and then um 
well, as soon as like I finished these and I, I made the Ascension at the same time. And I, when I ordered the canvases, I was like, okay, nine, I know that's a good number. Three, six, nine Tesla. Um, but it wasn't like this really like conscious intention. Uh, it's just kind of this cool way things unfold. Yeah. Well, I want to say, um, the two behind you are really beautiful for people listening uh, they're definitely worth popping over to the YouTube or the Rockfin to check out. Uh, obviously, the links to your work will be in our description uh, oh, of this cool. yeah. site. Yeah, on Instagram, so let's include that too. Yeah, awesome. But I want to point out, like, as we're talking, you know, I'm I'm focusing mostly on you, trying to like be a good host, but different colors throughout our conversation would like pop out, you know, because they're so multicolored, and I also noticed the very subtle like spinning motion of that center blue area and the one to behind you to the right it, yeah. it's really interesting uh like the way it's moved over the course of our conversation like you know like that sort of like thing that happens when you stare at an object or like a 2d image for long enough it sort of moves it's been happening while we're, while we're talking. I just but, want to point uh, I, that out. Great. I mean, these are like these are like my best friends. I hang out with them all the time, so it's cool to get some more feedback on them because uh, now it's my role to get them out into the world. Um, so yeah, that's that's great, and I'm, um, it's cool that it could be subtle like that. They're not meant to be ungrounded. Mm, wow. So, what? Um... What are your final thoughts? I mean, we've gone over a few different sort of areas today, talked about art, talked about Reiki, energy healing. Any final thoughts to leave our audience with before we go? We're kind of heading uh, an important time in, in uh, the stage of humanity's growth. Uh, what, what, what do you offer to the audience, you know, like things that they can take with them? Well, when I started to make, the Stargates in 2015, I knew that's the reason why I became an artist and why I've been had certain experiences and certain training by spirit. And I've been pushing through and developing the Stargates until I made the the nine that I mentioned. Um, the They're all 36 by 36. Uh, and what I achieved the ascension with, so that energy signatures in it. And I know that um, it's a very unique gift that I can offer the world. I know how hard it was to achieve, to achieve. I still have more spiritual benchmarks to go, but the paintings um, are going to help people, the viewer humanity um, learn how to empower themselves through the plane of mind, the emotional body, the physical body, which leads to upliftment and healing. And that's the key here. I, I, I'm not saying that they can heal a specific thing that's not my claim they will empower the energy will empower people the viewer um on a individual level that's appropriate empowerment leads to upliftment and then healing either finding the right doctor or letting go of a memory um and especially with chronic ongoing uh challenges and as we move forward in this new era with the ascension symptoms or side effects from the last few years, a lot of people are, are going to need it. Um, so it's this beautiful thing that I get to offer the world. And uh, as, you know, more and more unfolds, maybe we could talk again and um, I could share with people where to find the work. My goal is to uh, have them on permanent display so people can come see the come receive the energies at will um, and moving forward, take commissions for pieces. Cause it won't take as long now that I've, I've learned how to do it. Um, and yeah, moving forward, I tell people you're stronger than, you know, um, you have a lot of power from within to discover, keep digging deeper and trust the process. Wow. Yeah. I think these portals are tremendously important right now. We need to integrate this healing, you know, and, and you're right. It's not going to be 
uh, healing in itself to just, you know, witness the, the lesson. It's about the action that's inspired by that energy. Yeah, the, that's the thing. The individual has to do the work. It's nobody's going to do it for you. You have to save yourself or it has, it comes from within. You have the resources from within and it's a matter of doing the work to, um, to dig deep and find them and achieve it and empower yourself, which leads to healing, but you have to do the work. Wonderful. All yeah. right. So one final question that came to mind, uh, if you were to, to sum up what a portal is, because I think people might think of like wormholes or like, you know, things that could take you to another planet. <laughs> what is, what is a portal to you? Well, uh, so right behind me, <laughs> um, uh, like during, in my process, like I work with first ray energy, which is construction, deconstruction. So it's just kind of the way I interact with materials that, um, breaks it down and builds it up again and doing that repetitively studying and meditating and studying the esoteric symbols and including some of those symbols within the paintings, uh, as well as crystals on the back, which is cool. Uh, it's just, I aligned with my spiritual mission and the gift that, um, I've been assigned with. Um, I, 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 I don't know, like technically how it happened. I know I saw the way the symbols, like I had writing and then building up materials and taking it back. And then it just clicked with the inner knowing of what was going on. And then the first portal that came out was just, um, I could see light orbs coming and it just, it looked like I could reach in and go to the deep depths of the universe. And all of them were, had this, this depth to them. Um, and then it integrates. So it's like, the energy starts to spread out in the etheric web. So I call these portals, uh, these paintings portals because, uh, because of what I saw, um, people might feel it more. Um, not everyone's going to be see, see, Oh, that's a portal. It's probably, it's more of a reaction of like, I, I feel this energy. I, I sense this depth. Um, I'll mm. take it in, uh, yeah. as it's appropriate. And I specifically work uh, with Jupiter through the sun. And that's something I've learned through my process as well. So these link to Jupiter. And it's just something somebody's intuition is going to have to trust if it's the right fit for them. But I know what I know. And my goal is for people to look at the art. You know, I don't want to teach people. I want people to look at the art and have it be a mirror to how they can um, uplift and empower themselves. So it, it, it will work on that kind of exchange. Um, so it doesn't, you know, I'm more than happy to talk about my process, but I'm, I'm really interested in having the viewer interact with the painting and, and see how they start to uh, raise consciousness and um, deepen awareness. Yeah. That's the exciting part. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would love to have you back on as you grow and, and learn more and, and yeah, we can discuss what you've you've seen people experience because like sounds like yeah. you, you've only just begun to show these to the world. So uh, yeah, 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 please yeah. keep yeah. us I, in I touch. I appreciate the opportunity as well. This is really fun, and totally, I'll have to keep doing some more uh, energy work on New Haven as well, so we can integrate that again. Yeah, thank you, and and maybe one day we'll get a, a little tour going. And I'll have you do the energy work the day of, and we'll we'll have we'll be your men in the field uh, assessing of, <laughs> of to compare <laughs> notes, you know. But uh, this has been really fun getting to know you and and learning about Reiki from you, learning about your artistic process and your insights into so many things that I believe are important to this current stage where we find ourselves as human beings. So. For everyone listening, uh, where can they go to support you, to see your art, and uh, follow up with you? 
I post mostly on Instagram right now. And when I exhibit my artwork, I abbreviate my first name, Laura, to L. So it's L. Mylot Manning. It's L-M-Y-L-O-T-T-M-A-N-N-I-N-G. And I abbreviate my first name because of it's a certain energy resonance. And then it also helps people be more subjective when viewing the art. Like if they don't know who the artist is, it gives it a cleaner response um, on an energetic level. So, but I'm mostly on Instagram and uh, I, I currently have work up at Columbia university. It's an earlier Stargate in the center for theoretical physics. And that's open to the public Monday through Friday um, in New York. Um, yeah, and definitely let's touch base again. We'll see what what the exciting things are going to unfold now. Right on. Well, please, folks, go and support Laura wherever you can. Instagram seems to be the best place now, but stay tuned for more from her. And as for us right now, uh, I wish you the best and enjoy the moment wherever you are in the now. All right, and that is our episode with Laura Milo Manning, portal artist, energy worker. It was a great conversation. And we've got a bunch more in store for November. It's getting colder. My voice is a little scratchy. I hope it doesn't affect these uh, coming episodes too much with the intros and outros. But I am going to keep them a little shorter so I don't have to cough so much, but uh, I'm going to be turning on the Aqua Cure soon. I haven't set it up yet. We'll see. Maybe the Aqua Cure will take me out of this, and I will definitely document the healing journey along the way. Uh, use promo code MFTIC. I might have said promo code crazy. I got confused. Use promo code MFTIC, and you can get 20% off an Aqua Cure your very self if you don't know what that is go back and listen to episode george wiseman i don't know which number it is but does that really matter you'll see his name george wiseman and uh yeah that's about it for this episode folks support the show help me out on patreon shout out to all 101 of our patreon supporters the number has been fluctuating here and there so we did hit our 100th Patreon twice, and I want to thank both of them and everybody who signed up on the Patreon and everybody on the Rockfin and everybody who's helped out on Ko-Fi. If you'd like to join me for a Synchro Wisdom Dialogue, I just did another with a friend, a new friend, Shane. Shout out to Shane in Saskatchewan, Canada. And we're... We just put out a Synchro Wisdom Dialogue. So that's five episodes of this bonus show that you could listen to on the patreon and if you want if you value your time you value mine share some of that value with me through the ko-fi store schedule a synchro wisdom dialogue and you can be on the podcast and real soon i think i'm going to air a synchro wisdom dialogue uh, one of the episodes for free for people to listen to just to see what else is there on the Patreon. So you support the show, you get something back in return, and you get all the episodes early like this one, which is coming out the same day as our Halloween episode with Andreas Exertus. You can check me uh, tonight on Wednesday Ultra on Andreas Exertus's channel if this comes out on Wednesday, although it may come out on tuesday november 1st so either way uh, check me out wednesdays there and uh if you can send a one-time donation buy some merch we got a bunch of new merch i put up a hieronymus bosch all over print t-shirt last night i'm gonna make a few more of those they're not they, that easy to make because some of them come out pretty blurry uh, so if it looks too blurry uh, maybe don't buy it I think I'm going to buy a uh, test copy and a test sample shirt and see what it looks like. But um, anyways, just playing around with new stuff on the merch store. So check that out. And uh, yeah, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. Enjoy the moment so, well, wherever you are in the show. now. 
Peace. You know? Mark is doing a great job, even yeah. though he drives me fucking nuts yeah. sometimes. He's great. No, he's done a great job. He's done a great job. Good job, Mark. You can call uh, me Mark Palmer. Mark Palmer's cool. Mark Palmer's... It's a beautiful day to be alive. Motherfuckers. It's a beautiful day. Beautiful day. It's a beautiful day to be alive. That's all I gotta say. I don't think it's about money. I think they have so much. It's just about... It's a spiritual war, dude. It's so much farther. There's more power with spring flowers than pseudo intellectuals fueled by hate with the face sour. When it comes to the hour of reckoning, recollect, reconnect with days happening. Yeah, are you frowning or laughing? Are you making the grade or barely passing? Caught in the asinine like the afterlife. Obsessed with darkness after you mastered light. Cause it's faster than a blink. When it's a bastard, latch to the clank, clang The money don't mean a damn thing, think Happiness ain't coming from the bank, dang I'm out here daydreaming The spirit's the egg, the self is the semen uh, And that's cause life is the child And it takes a village to give it the illest style So, if your family think you crazy mm, And you ain't got a village No, you always got a place here I'm Come kick it, we chillin' Exactly, dude. You get it, bro. You're so smart, everybody. You're so smart. Feel like I'm waking up for the first time. Krusty's on my third eye, but I'm back to the grind. Pop the blinds open, let the sun shine. Feel it on my skin like it's been some time. Sometimes depression got me flaking like Sisyphus. Others got me messing with mania like Icarus. And meditation helps with the sickness. Some say it's human condition, but it just isn't. There's more power in spring flowers. The circular thoughts that leave the mind devoured. Blurred lines between reality and fiction. And some politicians get dirtier than dishes. But for a minute, just forget about the government. I'm looking at you and I and where the love went. Cause we don't need a fucking village full of cynics. Need a family to foster a life worth living if it isn't. And your family think you crazy. Yeah. And you ain't got a village. I know you always got a place here. Mm. Come kick it, we chillin', yeah. I'm a conspiracy boy. Motherfuckers. Motherfuckers. I'm a conspiracy boy. Motherfuckers. Motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a psychic. I'm a prophet, bro. Why, why are you questioning that? Never trust a dude in a sweater. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> Mark Palmer's cool. How are you, brother? I'm great, man. How are you?